Thanks for tuning in to Tax Strategy Digest, where we explore the fascinating world of finance. Join us as we dive into the stories, insights, and experiences of experts, thought leaders, and everyday people who are making a difference in this field. Through engaging conversations and thought-provoking discussions, we'll take a deep dive into the latest research, trends, and innovations shaping finance. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn something new on this journey here with us. Welcome to this episode of Tax Strategy Digest. Today, our guest is Amkar Shinde. Amkar is a financial advisor at Transamerica that has been helping countless individuals, families, business owners make financial decisions for their future. Amkar, thanks for joining me today on this episode. Excited to have you. Absolutely, Paul. Excited to be here. Awesome. Well, hey, tell us about your story. Yeah, man. So um, I'm a financial advisor. As you just said, um, I help create effective tax plans for a lot of salespeople. Um, I used to work in sales in the past. And so I kind of have an idea of what exactly goes on in that world. And I try to create as the best tax plans there are uh, possible. Um, so a little bit of backstory for me. I graduated in 2020 uh, from the University of Colorado at Boulder. I majored in chemical engineering. So a very different field than I'm, what I'm currently in. Um, and when I graduated, I graduated right in 2020, peak of COVID, you know, two, two, two months after COVID hit. And when I first got into the job market for chemical engineering, it was, uh, it was a pretty bad scenario. Um, I wasn't expecting uh, such low paying jobs. I wasn't expecting uh, relocating during COVID and stuff like that. So I kind of just moved on to finance because that's what I, I minored in. And that's something that I was really passionate about. Um, and as I started learning a little bit more about how I can help people in finance, I realized that financial literacy is a huge, huge area that America currently lacks in. And so I sat down with my mom, we mapped out a few scenarios and how I can kind of use this passion for finance to help people and uh, vetted a few companies and eventually found Transamerica. So um, I've been doing this for about three years now and I'm loving it. Nice. And what was sort of the, the transfer of, I guess, knowledge or, you know, the, your ideals to moving from chemical engineering? I know you said the jobs um, just weren't paying enough. You, you weren't expecting relocation during COVID, but you talked about a little bit of your passion to, to be yeah. in finance. What, what sparked that as a kid? Was it just growing up and seeing, you know, maybe your parents talked about money and you were interested in it? What, what was that initial uh, fire that, that lit that love and passion for you? Yeah. So uh, I actually didn't, I don't come from money. Um, my parents are immigrants uh, to America. So when we first came here um, back, my, my parents came here in 1998, but I actually came here um, to settle down in 2014. So when we first came here, we lived in a one bedroom apartment, me my sister and my parents. Um, money wasn't really talked around or talked about in our family. Um, it wasn't, it still is a taboo topic till today. But now that I'm a financial advisor, I try to get my parents to open up as much as possible. But the reason why I have such a, a, a passion for finance is mainly because number one, when I first got into it, I realized that the power of compound interest is huge. I could actually use this to you know, benefit myself and make a lot more money in the future uh, than I have any money right now. While I was in college, I would kind of show my friends what I'm doing with stocks and you, Robin Hood back then was a huge thing. So a lot of my friends would come to me for like advice, like, hey, what are you investing in? We're doing this and we're doing that. And as, as a college fraternity guy, I was just telling them, oh, do this, do that. Um, and kind of, as I mentioned, when I graduated, I kind of saw what finance has to offer. And I also saw that America is lacking in financial literacy. So I did a kind of research over there, like, what does it mean to be financially literate? What exactly are people struggling with? What are their pain points? And when I read all these pain points, I was like, I had the curse of knowledge, I guess, to put it that way. It's like, I feel like this is common sense. I feel like people should know what this is. I feel like people need to be taught what this is. And then after doing a bit of research, you're not taught about this in school. You're not taught about this in college. And so it was kind of that flame of like, if I can make money while helping people and helping them achieve their goals, I'd rather do that than work for a corporate in chemical engineering or any other thing that I do 
and help the company make money. That's kind of what still motivates me. That's kind of what, you know, puts that, that's, that's kind of like one of my pillars that I stand by uh, on my personal brand today. Nice. And, and talking about your personal brand, how did you decide you wanted to develop that? You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a choice. That's like, okay, I'm going to go and develop my personal brand and yeah. do this. But um, it initially started off as like, okay, like I need to start getting clients. Like uh, my first year and a half in business was really slow because my warm market was either like in, uh, it was between the age of 18 and 24, right? And so everyone's either in college or just graduated. You're not making a lot of money during that time. So like, what, what can I help you with? And so it was more like, okay, I need to attract people who, you know, are between 30 and 50, have a little bit of money. I can help them out. I can make significant changes. And so the best platform out there for social, like in terms of social media for a person like me is LinkedIn. And so I kind of got on LinkedIn. I, you know, as everyone starts out, they found Justin Welsh. They bought his <laughs> course. I did the same thing. Um, and then I started posting and being like, okay, I can do this. I can do that. This is what the content I offer. This is the content I offer. So a lot of experimentation. Um, I told a lot of my friends that I was going to be doing this. They laughed at me. The first three months, I barely had any traction because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but then as people started valuing my content, as they started valuing my opinions, I, as I started getting DMs saying, hey, I really like what you're doing here. Keep it up. Or like, hey, man, you really inspired me to take care of my finances. That's what kept me going. And that's what pushed me to become better in you know, creating a personal brand, understanding what it entails to, understanding how I can write better content. That's kind of what brought me to build a personal brand today and what kind of helped me um, or it's helping other financial advisors create a personal brand as well. So that's, that's kind of. I love it. And I, I think I actually found you through uh, Mondo Salavanti's page and I know you two yeah. both comment on each other's posts. And so I saw you on there one day and uh, that's actually how we initially met. Uh, we just had a conversation. I think one of us DM the other and just said, Hey, I really like your content. I think we should talk. Um, and I don't think we talked really about business at all. I think we just talked to each other, just hung out. Um, so any, if anybody's listening, you should do the same for Omkar. It'd be a, it was a fun <laughs> conversation and that's what led us here today. But, um, what are some of the things that you're doing right now on LinkedIn? I mean, what's worked for you, uh, to, to help you build your brand? At the start, when I first started out, I was putting out a lot of educational content, um, you know, just educating people about what our finances are, how it works, retirement vehicles. Um, and you definitely need that to build uh, authority An authority. So I basically follow the gap framework, which is growth, authority and personal. So these are the three pillars that I started posting about where authority is basically anything and everything that I do in my business about um this is how I helped my clients save taxes, or this is how I helped them get rid of debt or credit card debt or anything like that. That's authority content. Growth content is anything that's motivational, inspirational, helping you take action today so that you can, you know, get on your path to financial freedom today. And then personal is just basically any life stories that I have to share about um, maybe that I don't come from money or the fact that I was, you know, a broke college kid four years ago and look where I am today. It's kind of just, showing that I'm human as well. And the fact that you can relate to what kind of content I put out. So those are the kind of three pillars that I talk about. And uh, just going forward, you know, like make it, make it a daily task to connect with new creators, make it a daily task to um, put out some new content, repurpose your own, your own content that went, I guess, quote unquote viral a few, few months ago. Um, the more you can show that, you not it's not just what your service or product that you have to offer, but you can offer your own expertise, teach people two steps behind you. Um, that's will kind of, you know, uh, shine a light on you and separate you from the crowd. I love it. And tell me, I always like to ask advisors who are on the younger side, because myself included, I'm, I'm younger, I'm 24. And so when talking with younger advisors who have just come out of college, they're um, they don't have any gray hair yet. Obviously, it's a little bit harder when you have clients who are, you know, maybe in their 40s, 50s, 60s, even um, maybe older, who who knows where your clients will come from. But there's no doubt you're going to be able to help them. But how do you get past that? Hey, I don't have gray hair. Um, I am a younger guy. 
How do you get past that hurdle with them? That's a great question. And I struggled with that for, I would say, the first two years of my life as well. It's kind of like, you know, I'm 24. If I talk to a six-year-old who wants to retire, is he going to take me seriously, right? right. Is, he going to, is he going to invest his money with me, take my plan into action? But it just comes from a standpoint of like, no matter what your age is, you know, it's just a number. Um, I've gone through the certifications. I've taken the licensing tests. I've gone through college with a finance degree. I've done all that that I need to, to be um, in a place where I can help you. And just having that self-confidence in you and having that belief that you can help that person has kind of what has gotten me to sit down with clients who are older than me. Um, unfortunately, there weren't any actionable steps that I took like, oh, I'm going to, you know, study for 30 minutes. I never took any actionable content. It was just more of a, a mindset barrier is like, why did you do this? Why did you do this in the first place? Right. You know, according to the statistics, there are 70% of people out there are financially illiterate. If the person sitting in front of you is 60 years old, they've been in, let's say, construction their whole life, and they don't know anything about money, age shouldn't matter. It's just a point of, do you think you're capable to help this person or not? It's a simple yes or no question. If you are, then you shouldn't be scared sitting down with them. But if you have those fears, then it seems as if you need to work on yourself before you go and approach that person. Perfect. And are you getting most of those leads? Are those coming from LinkedIn, from your content you're putting out there? Or are those leads uh, coming from a different source? Maybe it's something like Twitter. Maybe you're on other social media platforms. You're running Google ads, Yelp. What's working the best for you? I don't run any ads. Um, I don't run any ads on LinkedIn either. Um, I just created a Twitter account like a month ago, but I'm not using that for leads either. So any of the business that I get is either through referrals, um, outbound DMs, or inbound leads. Um, and I would say 90% of my business comes from LinkedIn now. Um, I would say 10% comes from referrals outside. Um, as I mentioned, that authority content that I post in which I show people that, hey, this is how I help my client. This is how I can help you. Or even just um, screenshots of the DMs that I get of people thanking me or people wanting to be my clients has kind of put me in that authoritative state of like, okay, this person is legit. He, he gets what he's talking about and he has social proof behind what, uh, what he says. I think those things have really converted those inbound leads. And um, I like to do outbound DMs just because I used to be in sales. I know how to send some cold emails. Um, and it's always great to talk to people who are in that executive role. They're not going to reach out to you because they're execs and they have that pride for them. But if you can you know, target those people and get them to show you that you have value to provide, they're happy to do that as well. And what are a lot of these people reaching out to you about? What are they looking for? They're, they're just looking for uh, a majority of them have current pain. Like a lot of them have current credit card debt. A lot of them don't know if it's a good time to buy a house. A lot of them want to understand, hey, you know, I'm making 200 grand a year, but I have no retirement account set up. What do I do? So they have a lot of pain points. And I, I don't initially just put them into a plan. I like to sit down with them and hop on an intro call to see, hey, like, number one, is this a good fit? Do you believe my values? Do I understand where you're coming from? Um, and number two is like, hey, this is my process. This is how I help my clients. These are what I charge my fees and whatnot. Does this make sense to move for, uh, forward? And so after all that introductory call is done and it makes sense to move forward, then I move them into my process. So it's about providing value to gain that value. I'm not going to bring them on a call and be like, yeah, uh, I, we can be client. You can be my client. And uh, this is how much it is. You pay me and then I'll show you what to do. I'll just give all my value up front for free because I do that on LinkedIn anyways. And if they want to take it and go to someone else, they're free to do that. But if they want to take that same same value and bring it to me, I'll set up a plan for them. Perfect. And I talked to Evan Drury, who's also big on LinkedIn. I'm sure you probably are connected with him. And uh, we talked a little bit in our interview a few weeks back, and it was about how financial advisors are often a little bit of therapists for their client, you know, because you have to help them through some of the tougher decisions that they're going to make. And they're big decisions because they are about their finances. It does affect their well-being. It does affect whether or not 
their kids going to private school or if they're going on that family vacation, whatever that might be. So how have you adapted to that? Because I feel like COVID, the whole pandemic and and you really started working right at the basis of it. And so I I feel like that may or may not have, you tell me, but at least impacted the, um, the, the thought process of a lot of your clients who um, maybe they're just a little bit insecure. They don't want to make the wrong decision. They're worried about a pandemic. How have you combated that and been able to sort of be that therapist style uh, person while also really making sure that uh, their finances are well taken care of? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I've actually never thought of that before, but I, I agree with Evan, you know, we are sort of therapists in a way, um, along with, you know, kind of understanding and understanding where they come from. We also really need to educate them about, hey, this is what you're currently doing with your plan. And these are the goals that you want to achieve. Modeling where you are today and where you want to be tomorrow with your current situation, this is where you're going to end up. Um are you okay with that? You know, tell me a little bit about what would happen if you don't achieve those goals. If you achieve those goals, what are some changes that you've tried in the past? What haven't you tried in the past? You know, so it's mainly about like, not just, you know, think about it from a logical perspective of like, okay, here are the numbers, here's the calculator, and this is how much you need to invest every single month. It's like, how would you feel if you never achieved that goal of yours? How would you feel if you did achieve that goal of yours? So I've really found it, helpful if you can come from an emotional perspective of like you really want to send your kids to private school well okay this is how much it costs how how would you feel if you didn't send them to private school how would you feel about you know your image in society or or whatever that is um and so adapting to that has been a bit different and a bit at least a bit difficult for me because i'm not much of an emotional guy Um, And I'm very logical oriented, especially being in finance, you have to run the numbers, right? So um, COVID also kind of made that a little harder because now you don't have, you have Zoom for everything. I can sit down with the client, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword. I can sit down with the client, let's say in Michigan, um, because, you know, we're we're connected over Zoom, but at the same time, I don't have that human to human interaction, uh, sitting down face to face, um, reading their body language, reading their tone and stuff like that. so it's a, it's a blessing and a curse both, but um, adapting to that has been a bit difficult, but you know, only experience teaches you how to deal with that thing. And the more you can get in front of those situations, the better you can combat it going forward. Totally. And what's a piece of advice? Someone's coming into this industry. What's a piece of advice you would give them? Provide value to gain value. Um, I've, I've talked about this multiple times on LinkedIn. Um, unfortunately, there are people out there and wh- how our industry is known is like, there are a few crooks out there who've uh, sold a product or who sold a life insurance policy just to make money off of people, which wasn't a good fit. I would say, give everything away for free. You know, go ahead, go show people exactly what the numbers are. Show them if they invested money into this, what would happen? Give them everything for free because that's going to build that trust and that trust eventually is going to convert that into a client. People in the past, um, I would say maybe 20, 30 years ago, um, people didn't realize how to invest or maybe what the returns would be because we weren't that technologically savvy and we were a little bit behind and people wanted to keep their secrets with them so that they could gain that money. But in today's day and age, you have YouTube, you have podcasts, you have books, everything and anything at your disposal for free that a person can just pick up and put and like implement on their own. The only thing that separates you from that is the fact that you have experience and you're a human. So if you can, if you can use those two things to your advantage, you will be able to sit down with anyone and everyone and close them. That's awesome. That's perfect. And um, a couple quick fire off questions for you. Um, These are, you know, not really related to kind of your work or anything, but how do you define success and why? Maybe it's personal success or maybe it's success as a whole, but how do you define that for you? There are two ways that I define success. Number one, um, I want to hit a personable or a personal financial goal. That's how I define my personal success. 
my business success is when I help a hundred thousand individuals or families in the, uh, and that's throughout my entire business career, not talking about in a year or a month. I'm talking about, I want to be happy and I will be satisfied when I hit that goal, whether that be in 10 years, 20 years or 30 years. Awesome. Uh, have you ever had a mentor? I have. Yes. And, uh, who was that mentor? How did they help you? So I have a, a few different mentors. Number one, I actually uh, pay for a uh, a visualization coach. Um, so he's kind of a mentor in the fact that he helps me with uh, tips, tricks, techniques to kind of visualize myself having success. Uh, number two is one of my senior partners at my firm. Uh, he's one I work with closely. He's based out in Austin as well. And so kind of asking him questions, asking him his experience on how he's dealt with certain things. And he's been in the industry for about 12 years now. So getting that idea of how I can improve my business and replicate it just like him is what has helped me as well. Nice. Um, who has been the biggest influence in your life? It could be one of your coaches. It could be a family member, but who's that biggest influence been? Uh, the biggest influence would be my my partner um she is very hard working she's very goal oriented and she's very she she craves stability and so her her drive kind of motivates me to get up get out of bed and you know help help a client help a family um and her stability helps me be like okay hey, if i take risks i am okay because in life, you need to take risks to make a big, whatever you do, whether it be a business, whether it be finances, whether it be anything, you have to take risks. So her stability motivates me to take risks on my own. Perfect. And um, last question is, what is your why? Why do you do what you do? As I've mentioned, kind of like the overlooming topic of this this podcast is financial literacy. Number one is financially uh, financial literacy. Um it's unfortunate that we're not taught this in school. It's unfortunate that we don't learn about this until we actually have a sort of financial catastrophe in our life that, oh, well, I should have saved more for retirement or I should have haven't had an emergency fund or I should not have put credit card debt and whatnot. So educating not just people who are about to retire, but also people behind me so that they're not found in that same situation that maybe their parents are in is huge for me because I think everyone should be uh, financially free at one point. Um, they're not trapped within, you know, working for their employer because they have $10,000 worth of debt or, you know, I just want them to make sure they have access to anything and everything that they want. Um, that's number one. And number two, personally, my why is to prove people wrong. Um, as everyone goes through life, you have people who support you and people who don't support you. The people who don't support you, I want to prove them wrong. So I can eventually say, hey, I did it. And, you know, just prove them wrong. I love it. I love it. Well, hey, I'm going to put your LinkedIn bio down below. So anybody who wants to reach out to you, if they're not already connected with you, they can go ahead and do that. Is there anywhere else that people should reach out to you? Uh, no. Yeah. On my LinkedIn profile and I have a Calendly link uh, in my LinkedIn profile. So if you ever need help or just want to chat, that's always there. I highly recommend at least sending him over a message or scheduling a time. It was one of my favorite conversations that I've had on LinkedIn. And so, um, I don't think we even talked about a business or anything. I think I said that already, but, um, we didn't talk about business the first time we talked and I think maybe slipped it in there for 30 seconds, but it was super yeah. friendly, super fun. So definitely recommend it. Amkar, thanks so much for coming on. Absolutely, Paul. It was a pleasure being here.